Chapter Six, Part Two of Conversations on the Plurality of Worlds. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in April two thousand nineteen. Conversations on the Plurality of Worlds by Bernard Le Bouvier de Fontenelle, translated by William Gardiner. Chapter Six, Part Two. Oh, says the Countess, since tis possible that this grand equality should be only in our imagination, I'm entirely convinced it is derived only from thence. I'm very well pleased that any which is against the genius of nature should fall entirely upon ourselves, and that she should stand discharged, though at our expense. For my part, says I, I'm such a foe to a perfect equality that I cannot even allow that all the turns which the earth every day makes on herself should be precisely in four and twenty hours, and always equal one to another. I should be very much inclined to think that there are differences. Differences? cried the countess. Why? Do not our pendulums mark an entire equality? Oh, says I, to your pendulums I must object, for they cannot be altogether just. And sometimes when they are, in showing us that one circuit of twenty-four hours is longer or shorter than another, we should rather be inclined to believe them irregular than to suspect the earth of any irregularity in her revolutions. What a pleasant respect is this we have for her, I would no more depend on the earth than on a pendulum. And the very same casualties almost which will disorder the one will make the other irregular. Only, I believe, there must be some more time allowed for the earth than a pendulum to be visibly put out of order, and that's all the advantage we can give on her side. But might she not by degrees draw nearer to the sun? And there finding herself in a situation where the matter is more agitated and the motion more rapid, she will in less time make her double revolution more about the sun and herself, so consequently her years and days will be much shortened, but not to be perceived, because we must still go on to divide the years into three hundred and sixty-five days and the days into twenty-four hours, so that without living longer than we do now, we shall live more years, and on the other hand, as the earth shall withdraw from the sun, we shall live fewer years than we do now, and yet have our lives of the same extent. There is a great deal of probability, says the countess, that whenever it falls out so, long successions of ages will make but very little differences. I agree with you, madam, replied I. The conduct of nature is very nice, and she has a method of bringing about all things by degrees, which are not sensible, but in very obvious and easy changes. We are scarce able to perceive the change of the seasons, and for some others, which are made with a certain deliberation, they do not fail to escape our observance. However, all is in a perpetual whirl, and not so much as the lady's face in the moon, which was discovered with telescope, within this twenty years, but what is grown considerably old. She had a good tolerable countenance, but now her cheeks are sunk, her nose grown long, and her chin and forehead meet, so that all her graces are vanished, and age has made her a terrible spectacle. "'What a story do you tell me?' says the Countess, interrupting me. "'Tis no imposition, madam,' replied I. "'They have perceived in the moon a particular figure, which had the air of a woman's head jetting out of rocks, and it is owing to some changes that have happened there. Some pieces of mountains have mouldered away, and left us to discover three points, which can only serve to make up the forehead, nose, and chin of an old woman. Well, says she, but don't you think it is some destiny that had a particular spite to beauty? And very justly it was this female head, which she would attack above all the moon. Perhaps in recompense, replied I, 
the changes which happen upon our earth dress out some face which the people in the moon see i mean something like what we conceive a face in the moon for every one bestows on objects those ideas of which they themselves are full our astronomers see on the surface of the moon the faces of women and maybe if the ladies were to make their speculations they would discern the resemblance of fine men's faces for my part madam i don't know whether i should not fancy your ladyship's charms there i protest says she i can't help being obliged to any one who should find me there but to come back to what you were mentioning just now do any considerable changes affect the earth in all appearance they do replied i our fables tell us that hercules with his hands split asunder the two mountains called kelpi and abila which stand betwixt Africa and spain stopped the ocean from flowing there and that immediately the sea rushed with violence over the land and made that great gulf which we call the mediterranean now this is not wholly fabulous but a history of those remote times which has been disguised either from the ignorance of the people or through the love they had for the marvellous the two most ancient frailties of mankind that hercules should separate two mountains with his two hands is absolutely incredible but that in the time of one hercules or other for there were fifty of that name the ocean should force down two mountains not so strong as others in the world and perhaps through the assistance of some earthquake and so take his course betwixt europe and africa gives me no manner of pain to believe what a notable spot might the lunar inhabitants all of the sudden discover on our earth for you know madam that seas are spots it is not less the common opinion that sicily was disjoined from italy and cyprus from syria there are sometimes new islands formed in the seas earthquakes have swallowed up mountains others have rose and have altered the course of the planets the philosophers give us apprehensions that the kingdoms of naples and sicily which are countries laid upon great subterranean vaults full of sulphur will one day sink in when those vaults shall no longer be able to resist the flames which they contain and that this time exhale at vents to wit vesuvius and etna is not here enough to diversify the sight which we give to the people in the moon i had much rather says the countess that we disgusted them with the same object always than diverted them with the swallowing up of provinces i don't know replied i if within this little time there have not been several burnt up in jupiter what provinces burnt up in jupiter cries the countess upon my word that would be considerable news very considerable says i madam we have remarked this year in jupiter a long trail of light more glaring than the rest of that planet's body we have here had deluges perhaps they may have suffered great conflagrations in jupiter how do we know to the contrary jupiter is ninety times bigger than the earth and turns on his one centre in ten hours whereas we don't turn in less than four and twenty which implies that his motion is two hundred and sixteen times stronger than ours may it not be possible that in so rapid a circulation its most dry and combustible parts should take fire as we see the axle trees in wheels from the force of motion will perfectly flame but however it is this light of jupiter is by no means comparable to another which in all probability is as ancient as the world and yet we have never seen it how does a light order it to be concealed says the countess there must be some singular address to compass this point this light replied i never appears but at twilight which is often strong enough to drown it and even when twilight suffers it to appear either the vapours of the horizon rob us of it or it is so very faint and hard to be perceived that for want of exactness in our knowledge we mistake it for the twilight but in short 
for these last fifteen years they have with much certainty distinguished it and it has been for some time the delight of the astronomers whose curiosity wanted waking by some novelty and they could not well have been more touched if they had discovered some new secondary planets the two latter moons of saturn for instance did not ravish them to that degree which the guards or moons of jupiter did but now we are fully accustomed to it we see one month before and after the vernal equinoctial when the sun's set and the twilight over a certain whitish light resembling the tail of a comet we see the same before sunrise and before the twilight towards the autumnal equinoctial and towards the winter solstice we see at night and morning except at these times it can't as i but now observed disengage itself from the twilights which are too strong and lasting for we suppose it to be a continued light and in all probability it is so we have begun to conjecture that it is produced from some prodigious quantity of matter crowded together which circles around the sun to a certain extent the greatest part of his rays pierce through his gross circuit and come down to us in a right line but some resting on the inner surface of this matter are from thence reflected to us and come with the direct rays or else we can't have them either morning or evening now as these reflected rays are shot from a greater height than those which are direct we must consequently have them sooner and keep them longer on this foot i must acquiesce in what i have already mentioned that the moon must have no twilight for want of being surrounded by such a gross air as the earth but she can be no loser her twilights will proceed from that kind of gross air which surrounds the sun and reflects his rays on places which his direct ones cannot reach but pray let me know says the countess are not their twilights settled for all the planets who will not need every one to be clothed with a distinct gross air because that which surrounds the sun alone may have one general effect for all the planets in the vortex i am mighty willing to think that nature agreeable to that inclination which i know she has to economy and good management should make that single means answer her purpose yet replied i notwithstanding that supposed economy she must have with respect to our earth two causes for twilight one whereof which is the thick air about the sun will be pretty useless and can only be an object of curiosity for the academy students but not to conceal anything it is possible that only the earth sends out from herself vapours and exhalations gross enough to produce twilights and that nature had reason to provide by one general means for the necessities of all the other planets which are if i may so say of a purer mould and their evaporations consequently more subtle we are perhaps those among all the inhabitants of the worlds in our vortex who required to have a more gross and thick air given us to breathe in with what contempt would the inhabitants of the other planets consider us if they knew this they would be out in their reasoning says the countess but not to be despised for being wrapped about with a thick air since the sun himself is so surrounded pray tell me is not this air produced by certain vapours which you have formerly told me issued from the sun and does it not serve to break the first force of his rays which had else probably been to excess i conceive that the sun may be veiled by nature to be more proportioned to our use well madam replied i this is some small opening to a system which you have started very happily we may add that these vapours may produce a kind of rain which falling back upon the sun may cool and refresh it as we sometimes throw water into a forge when the fire is too fierce there is nothing which we may not presume to help out nature's address but she has another kind of address very particular which is to conceal herself from us and we should not willingly be confident that we have found out her method of acting on her designs in it in case of new discoveries we should not be too importunate in our reasonings 
though we are always fond enough to do it and your true philosophers are like elephants who as they go never put their second foot to the ground till their first be well fixed the comparison seems the more just to me says she as the merit of those two species of animals elephants and philosophers does not at all consist in exterior agreements i am willing to mistake the judgment of both now teach me some of the latter discoveries and i promise you not to make any rash systems i'll tell you madam replied i all the news i know from the firmament and i believe the freshest advices you can have i am sorry they are not as surprising and wonderful as some observations which i read t'other day in an abridgment of the chinese annals written in latin and published lately they see a thousand stars at a time which fall from the sky into the sea with a prodigious noise or are dissolved and melt into rains and these are things which have been seen more than once in china i met with this observation at two several times pretty distant from each other without reckoning a certain star which goes eastward and bursts like a squib always with a great noise it is great pity that these sort of phenomena should be reserved for china and that our countries should never have their share of these sights it is not long since our philosophers thought they might affirm on good grounds that the heavens and all the celestial bodies were incorruptible and therefore incapable of change and yet at the same time there were other men in the other part of the earth who saw stars dissolve by thousands which must produce a very different opinion but says the countess did we ever hear it aloud that the chinese were such great astronomers tis true we did not says i but the chinese have an advantage from being divided from us by such a prodigious tract of earth as the greeks had over the romans by being so much prior in time distances of every sort pretend a right of imposing on us in reality i think still more and more that there is a certain genius which has never yet been out of the limits of europe or at least not much beyond them perhaps he may not permit it to spread over any great extent of the earth at once and that some fatality prescribes him very narrow bounds let us indulge him whilst we have him the best of it is he is not fettered up to the sciences and dry speculations but launches out with as much success into subjects of pleasure in which point i question whether any people equal us these are subjects madam that ought to give you entertainment and make up your whole system of philosophy end of chapter six part two end of conversations on the plurality of worlds by bernard le bouvier de fontenelle Translated by William Gardiner